As we've seen in another video, MicroPython is a fantastic firmware that allows us to run Python code on the ESP8266. However, so that we are able to take the most advantage of this firmware, we need to learn how to use a few tools. In this video, we're going to see the entire process of configuring an ESP8266 from running MicroPython all the way to using the tools that we need to upload scripts that will run on startup. All right, let's do this. This video is sponsored by LCSC Electronics. Using your favorite CAD program, you can simply export the bill of materials and use the BOM tool built into their website to get the components you need for your design. They'll help you even find components out of stock, they'll ship it for very cheap, and they have great facilities, wonderful people, so I highly recommend LCSC Electronics. For this tutorial, I'm going to use the trusty Node MCU development board for the ESP8266. The first thing we'll need is to download the image for MicroPython, which we can find on their website. I'll go ahead and download the latest one. And using the terminal on my computer, I'm going to use a built in tool called EC install to install the program that we'll need to load the firmware onto the ESP8266. Once this is done, and making sure, as I've shown in other videos, that the USB drivers for this particular board are installed, I'll go ahead and connect it to the USB port of my computer. Using the ls command, I can verify that indeed the board is recognized by the computer. I'll copy the name of the USB port as listed by the operating system, change directories into the downloads folder, I'll use the ESP tool with the corresponding options to first erase the flash memory on the ESP8266, and then to write the MicroPython image to the flash memory of the chip. With this done, we're ready to test things out. Using another built-in tool called Screen, I'm going to establish a USB connection to the firmware running on the ESP8266. With the connection established, I can run Python commands that will be interpreted by the firmware and executed accordingly. If I use built-in modules like Machine, for example, I can turn on and off the built-in LED. There are plenty of examples to try online, so I invite you to go through them. But for this tutorial, I'll go ahead and quit the screen session by pressing Ctrl A followed by K. For this next step, as we've seen in another MicroPython video, we'll need to install Homebrew, which is a fantastic package manager for Mac OS X that allows us to install things like Python 3 that we need for the next few steps. I'll also need to install the virtual env tool for creating isolated Python environments. With it installed, I'll create a directory that I'll call virtual envs, where I will keep all the virtual environments that I will create. Using the tool that we just installed and specifying that we want to use Python 3, I'll go ahead and create a new virtual environment for Python called MicroPython. This simply creates a directory with all the necessary things that we'll need to run a Python 3 environment with different packages that we'll need for our particular purpose. We can see that the contents are pretty straightforward and using the command source, we can activate this virtual environment. You'll see that the prompt on your terminal changes to indicate that you're now in a Python virtual environment. The last tool we'll need is the fantastic R shell utility developed by Dylens and whose source can be seen on GitHub. R shell is a remote MicroPython shell written for Python 3. Using the package manager pip3 for Python 3, we'll go ahead and install R shell 
on our virtual environment. Using this remote shell is pretty straightforward. We just need to specify the USB port of the chip that's running MicroPython. Once the shell is connected over USB, we can use similar Unix type commands that we do in our terminal. But more importantly, it is able to communicate with the board and mount it as a directory that is called by default PyBoard. We see that by default there is only one accessible file called boot.py in the flash file system of the MicroPython image running on the ESP8266. We can also run a read evil print loop like we were doing before using the command screen. Once again, this allows us to live type commands in Python that will be executed by the MicroPython firmware. We can turn on and off the LED, and even by pressing Ctrl D, we can have a software reboot of the board. To exit this live coding session, we press Ctrl X, and to exit from our shell, we press Ctrl D. Once I'm back into my terminal session, remembering that we're still inside our active virtual environment, I'll go ahead and create a directory that I'll call source src. And inside of there, I'll create a Python script with the goal of uploading it to the board and having the MicroPython firmware run it automatically. I'll start with a simple print statement, establish a new R shell session, and use our shells version of the command cp to copy this file onto the mounted pyboard directory. Using the command ls, we can see that the file was indeed copied successfully. So if I open a new REPL instance, I can see that if I import the file as a module, it'll print the message as expected. So let's go ahead and modify it I'll include a couple of modules and simply have the built-in LED on the board toggle on and off a few times. If I copy once again the file onto the flash file system running on the ESP8266, it'll overwrite the last version of the file. Notice that I've named this file main.py on purpose because the firmware will automatically run it when it boots up. So if I hit the reset button, I should see indeed the LED toggle on and off 10 times. And there you have it. Really quickly, we've gone over all the different tools that we need to make MicroPython actually usable. And it's something that was missing in a few other tutorials that I've seen on YouTube. If you like my videos, I invite you to my Patreon page where you can chip in a buck or two that really helps me put in more time into the videos and release them quicker. But whatever you do, don't forget to like, subscribe, or leave me a comment. You can also interact with me on social media. I'm on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, and you can even use the community tab of the channel. Thank you for watching my videos, and I will see you next time.